great uh, opportunity for, for sort of an in-depth look at the interface between um, science and, and the all-important science journal. Um, so, I don't know if you guys saw this article in the New York Times. It's kind of a big deal. Um, it's talking about the discovery of a planet not much larger than Jupiter outside the solar system. It was uh, recently reported this article of uh, Swerve Park College scientists at the AAS meeting. And um, it's orbiting Barnard Star. Um, and you know, whenever you find these planet articles, there's always, um, you know, there's always sort of talk about, uh, it's not really like the Earth, but it, it, it's exciting, nevertheless. And um, the new finding and support to the conviction of astronomers that a great many solar systems exist, some of them possibly supporting life. And so what's interesting about this article is that it wasn't from the most recent AAS meeting, rather it was from a meeting in 1963. Um, <laughs> announcing the discovery of a planet orbiting a uh, Barnard star. And uh, this was done by Peter Vandekamp. And um, the way that he detected the, the, this erstwhile planet, actually two planets, he, uh, by 1969 he found another planet around Barnard star. Barnard star is a nearby red dwarf, and it has a halo orbit around our galaxy, so it's not participating in the motion that the sun is, is engaged in, but rather it's sort of diving vertically through the plane of the galaxy. So as a result, because it is moving in a different direction, and because it's so close, it moves very, very rapidly across the sky. So this is just over a few years relative to the background stars from 1985 to 2005, you can see that Barnard star is changing its position relative to the background stars, which are much further away and moving much more slowly um, with respect to us. <clears throat> and so the way this planet was discovered was, as Barnard star traces its trajectory across the sky, there is a yearly motion from the Earth's perspective changing. As the Earth goes around the sun, we get a vantage point. And then also, if you subtract that out, what Van de Kamp uh, measured was what he interpreted as this sort of back and forth motion on the plane of the sky, which was the response of the star to one, and then he believed later two planets orbiting it. So this was announced to great fanfare, made the first front page of the New York Times. It was a big science journalism story from 1963. And what's, what's really interesting about this story is that you could just take it, the only way to know that this is from 1963 is the fact that the font is subtly different. And the New York Times changed their font relatively recently. And it's a similar font, but it, it's, that's the only clue. Everything else is as modern as can be. Right? Just turn this copy in yesterday. <laughs> um, and so this method that was used to discover these clean planets orbiting Barnard star is called astrometry. And um, because of the Barnard star planet claims, astrometry was seen as having great prospects for the detection of planets orbiting other stars. So this, is a, this is an article from 1979 that was written by uh, a NASA Ames scientist. Ames is just right over the hill. And it's sort of talking about how planets are going to be detected in coming decades. Right? So it's always interesting to look back at what you wrote, look back at what was written uh, after the coming decades have taken place to see how things went. And um, there's basically four methods for planet detection that are outlined in this, this review article. Um, the, the one that gets the most attention is this astrometric method, which was used by Van de Kamp to, to elicit these detections of planets orbiting Barnard star. There's also talk about direct detection. Direct detection is when you just take a picture of the planet. Now, that's very, very difficult because the stars are so far away, and most importantly, they're so bright in comparison to the planet that it's very, very difficult to separate the star light from the planet light. Now, Claire, Max talked about, yeah, about this earlier today, right? So she talked about all the effort that's gone into solving that problem. And so planets are indeed now beginning to be detected through direct detection. This is 
sort of a, a planet right on the edge. This is a, a five Jupiter mass planet orbiting a 25 Jupiter mass brown dwarf. Claire probably showed the dramatic images from HR 8799, so I, I didn't, didn't show them here. But this direct detection is starting to work out. And then this, this article from 1979 also mentions two other methods. One is the radial velocity method, and the other is the transit method. So it turned out that over the next few decades, those two methods, transits and radial velocities, were the ones that have really borne fruit so far, although the direct detection is starting to also become very, very interesting. Astrometry, despite its early initial promise, really hasn't produced very many results. So here's the Keck telescope. You probably saw that earlier this morning on Mauna Kea. And here's a spectrum of a star, nearby star, um, Procyon, which um, was taken with the Keck telescope. And you can see, when you take the, the light from the, from, from the star, you break it into a bunch of um, colored bins. This is um, the speck of the star. And you see all these dark lines. These are atomic absorption lines that are formed in the stellar atmosphere. And the light from the hotter levels of the star goes to the cooler atmosphere, it experiences absorption. And so if a planet is being orbited by a star, then what's actually happening is the two bodies are both orbiting their very center. They're both orbiting their point of balance. And so if this hand, if my left hand is the star and my right hand is the planet, then the planet is making a large circle around a large orbit around the very center, and the star is making a smaller orbit around the very center. But nevertheless, as the star goes around the very center, you, from your viewpoint in the audience, see my hand going toward you and going away from you. And so that causes the entire spectrum to shift slightly to the left, then slightly to the right. When the planet, when the star is coming toward the observer, you see a slight blue shift in all the lines. And when the star is going away from the observer, you see a slight red shift in all the lines. These red shifts and blue shifts are absolutely tiny. They're nothing like the cosmological red shifts that are observed. They're extremely subtle because the star, when orbited by the kinds of planets that people are interested in, is moving just a few meters per second. The star, if uh, is orbited by an Earth-like planet, is, is moving roughly six centimeters per second. So it's literally going at this speed, and it's a very huge challenge to detect that. The way that this is done practically, there's several methods in detail. This one that's used at the Keck telescope is to imprint upon the st spectrum from the star, you shine the star starlight through iodine gas, which is at rest with respect to the telescope. And that iodine gas, the iodine molecules absorb in lots and lots of different very particular frequencies, imposes this dense forest of lines on the stellar spectrum. And so as the star moves back and forth, the iodine lines, which are superposed here, don't move. They stay in exactly the same colors. And the starlight lines shift ever so, uh, ever so little back and forth to the red or to the blue. And when you cross-correlate all of the absorption lines from the star with all of these iodine lines, you can statistically detect very, very tiny shifts. Tiny shifts that are just a very small fraction of a single pixel. So this very subtle Doppler shift of the star, using all the information in the star spectrum, can elicit these very small back and forth movements. That's the core, that's the essence of the radial velocity method. So here, here are the radial velocities from, from Barnard's star. This is um, you know, the, the star that in 1963 was claimed to be orbited by two individual planets. And these are radial velocities that have been taken in a number of different telescopes, including the Keck telescope, um, this is 1998 here, 2006 here. And if the planets that had been detected in 1963 were actually there, if they were there, then these radial velocities would be varying in a way that would follow this curve. This is basically the back and forth movement, movement of the star as these planets are orbiting it. And as you can see, uh, this, this curve is not being respected. So those, those planets aren't there. So the, the radial velocity method has shown that, 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 that those planets orbiting Barnard's star, this nearby red dwarf, don't exist. In fact, yeah, question. Is that, is that how they found out that the planets weren't real, or did they know before? 
Um, so so the, the planets, almost as soon as they were announced, started to become controversial. And you can see, actually, and so, so this, is, this is a great, this is a great um, you know, sort of exercise as, as a science journalist, especially when it comes to extrasolar planet claims. You, the data is usually there, it's usually public, you can analyze it yourself, you can apply common sense. You can see these, these, these like scattered points here, this, this is not, this is not uh, a bona fide detection. The statistics of this type of are very weak. And then furthermore, what it turned out is that they were literally changing the lens on the telescope here, 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 and here. So they, they were changing the lens of the telescope on this 10 year and get it out clean and put it back in. And that was causing systematic shifts. This, this is still a problem, not lenses anymore, but systematic errors play any scientific detection that is right on the interesting edge. The articles that you want to write about are invariably tied up with two and a half to three sigma detections. And so by the very fact that it's interesting enough for you to be writing an article about it means that you're dealing with systematic errors, you're dealing with worrisome drifts in the data, you're dealing with statistical interpretations. If the planet was obviously there, it already would have been announced, the stories would have been written by somebody else. And so you, as scientists, jur science journalists, are part of this process of discovery and can play an important role of eliciting just common sense, right? If it doesn't make sense, if you can't get from the scientists a really clear understanding of why this detection should be believed, don't believe it. Um, so, so interestingly enough, there's, there's no evidence yet for any planets orbiting Barnard Star. Barnard Star is the second nearest stellar system. Um, this is a signal that would be produced if you had a three Earth mass planet orbiting Barnard Star in an orbit where liquid water could exist on the planet's surface. Um, you see this sort of back and forth wiggle up and down. There's, there's no evidence that this data you know, conforms to either this signal or any other signal. So there's no evidence yet of any planets orbiting Barnard Star. It's likely that any planets that are there are of an Earth mass or less. And we'll know in a few years whether or not there are Earth mass planets orbiting Barnard Star, but they're certainly not these large mass ones that were announced in 1963. Um, so, you know, the, the whole history of extrasolar planet detection from the 1850s onward was just one failure after another. Um, the first sort of bona fide or like you know, scientifically what a reasonably well justified claim was for a planet orbiting 70 Omiyuki in 1855, which was debunked um, by 1900, and then claims came in and out of the literature all through the 20th century. Barnard Star was one of the most exciting ones from 1963. It had been largely debunked by the early 80s, although um, Peter Van de Kamp himself like went to his grave believing that those planets were there. Um, during the 20th century, it became increasingly clear that planetary systems should probably be common. It became uh, increasingly clear that, that planetary systems are forming from the collapse of molecular cloud cores. Like, th th this is an especially nice example because it's isolated. This thing right here is a bar art 68. This contains roughly two solar masses worth of hydrogen helium gas, uh, which is intermixed with dust so that you can't see through the cloud in the visible uh, region of the spectrum. This thing is about a half a light year across, and this thing is too cold to support itself against its own self-gravity. Um, this, this, this cloud is producing some pressure. Temperature in here is about 10 to 15 degrees Kelvin, so the gas is pushing out a little bit. But the self-gravity of the gas is uh, basically causing this thing to contract. And this, this cloud is likely gravitationally unstable. This cloud will likely collapse um, from the inside outwards. The center will begin to collapse. The outer parts will begin to fall down. And even though this cloud is sort of sitting there in, in, in this picture, 
if you looked at this with a time lapse movie that lasted for, you know, say, 100,000 or a million years, you would see this thing <laughs> oscillating and sort of bubbling and, and, and boiling. And it has a very slight sense of rotation in one direction or another, just randomly. It has a very slight uh, sense of rotation. So what will happen is when you take this cloud and collapse it under its own weight, angular momentum conservation will mean that the material will start spinning noticeably quickly when it, when it gets near the center. Scale model for this thing is take a grain of sand and then spread that grain of sand uniformly out over a sphere roughly half a mile across. So it's incredibly tenuous. And it's interesting too, if you took the grain of sand and ground that up as finely as you could and dispersed it over a half mile radius sphere, you would certainly be able to see through it. No problem at all. Right? It would be completely transparent. And this cloud, interestingly enough, is, is totally opaque. So that's an exercise, exercise for the listener as to why that is. Scientists in the audience can think about that. I got stumped by that. Like a, a high school student asked me that. So I had to stop for like an hour. But, yeah. um, <clears throat> so this is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in the early 90s. And this thing right here is about twice the size of our own solar system. Like the, those, those objects that Mike Brown detects would be superimposed on it, would be sort of orbiting at this, this sort of size. This is a rotating disk of gas and dust in the Orion Nebula, which is backlit by glowing gas. So you're seeing this thing sort of in, in relief. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that there's like a hint of a red glow right here with the imaging processing that was used. There's a protostar down in the center of this donut-shaped object. And this stuff is all orbiting around this, this um, protostar in the center. This is a computer simulation from 1994 from my um, um, PhD thesis. And so we were at that time all excited by objects like this. And so this is a computer simulation which shows what at that time we thought was happening in, in um, the centers of these molecular cloud cores. This is the structure that results, or rather a cross section through the structure that results when one of these clouds collapses under its own weight. <clears throat> in this particular simulation, you have about a half of the solar mass down here in the center, um, and then roughly half the solar mass in a very heavy disk that's orbiting. And we've taken sort of a slice through that meridian, meridional slice through that so that you can see the density structure. And then there's still material falling inward. There's an accretion shock out here. And this is sort of a, a, a protostellar disk that's, that's, that's building up. And so, in the mid-1990s, we sort of had, and by we, I mean the entire astronomical community, um, had this sort of idea that, that solar systems formed from these, these disks, these protostellar disks, and they formed in sort of this bottom-up <clears throat> sort of way. You had uh, dust which would agglomerate into larger and larger sort of dust bunny-like objects which eventually would get large enough <clears throat> so that they could start feeling each other uh, gravitationally. And then eventually you would reach a size where these objects were several times more massive than Earth, and they were actually starting to affect the flow of gas in the disks and accreting gas, and then eventually leading to Jupiter-like planets. Um, this is the, you know, the inventory of our own solar system. We have gas giant planets like Jupiter, ice giant planets, Uranus and Neptune. The Jupiter is about 318 times more massive than the Earth, and it's mostly hydrogen and helium, with maybe 30 Earth masses of heavier stuff. Um, Neptune here is 17 Earth masses, and it's mostly water. A couple of Earth masses of hydrogen and helium, but it's mostly water, and a couple of Earth masses of rock. Then you have the terrestrial planets like um, um, Venus or Earth, and then finally all the icy outer dwarf planets in the outer part of the solar system. Um, and what's interesting is, is when we only had our own solar system to, to deal with, we sort of naturally assumed that our solar system was typical, 
and that you know, planetary systems would look in some sense like our own. And if I had been on the ball when I was a graduate student or if other people had been on the ball and have really been thinking carefully, um, there were some clues that, that things might not work out the way they worked out in our own solar system. This is a fantastic article that was written in 1980 um, <clears throat> right after Voyager took its first uh, flyby by Saturn. Um, this is actually a Cassini picture, but I just like it because it's so you know, sort of mysterious of Saturn and its rings. And um, by, studying, by studying the Voyager photographs, um, the, the rings of Saturn have a great deal of analogy to these sort of disks of gas and dust that orbit um, protostars. The rings of Saturn are very thin, but the physics is, is actually quite similar. And what Voyager saw was that the, the rings of Saturn are interspersed with, with satellites, small moons. And the small moons are interacting gravitationally with the rings. They send spiral waves running through the rings. They pull on the rings. The ring pulls on them. And there's just this very, very delicate and fantastically intricate sort of set of, of behaviors that are going on. And Voyager's snapshots as it went by gave insight into that and allowed Peter Goldreich and Scott Tremaine to think carefully about how planets might interact with gas disks. And in the abstract of this paper, there's this, this key sentence which says that the torques that are exerted on planets as they form might cause the planets to very, very quickly migrate through the protoplanetary disk. Everything that was done by me, everybody else prior to 1995, kind of imagined that Jupiter would stay put as it formed. It would sort of orbit in the disk and gradually build up mass. This was the one hint that that might not be happening. There was another very, very interesting hint from 1962 um, by, by, by a Japanese scientist, Kozai. What Kozai um, studied was just this very sort of simple, in essence, effect coming only from Newton's laws, which is now called the Kozai mechanism. And what the Kozai mechanism does is if you have two bodies that are in a wide orbit, and a third body is orbiting one of those two on an eccentric orbit, then Newton's laws of gravity will cause the orbit of that third body to cycle between states where it has a high inclination and a low eccentricity. That is, when it has a nearly circular orbit that's tilted, and times when it has an orbit which is extremely elongated, um, but which is not tilted. And so it's sort of this kind of back and forth sloshing of the orbit is driven by this three-body gravitational interaction. And so knowing only about that, and knowing only that binary stars exist, should have allowed anybody who was on the ball with their dynamics to realize that there is a completely natural mechanism to deliver planets, Jupiter mass planets, Earth mass planets, into orbits that come very, very close to the parent star. It was also understood since the time of Darwin, um, George Darwin, not, not, not Charles Darwin, but his son George Darwin, understood how tidal interactions worked and would have immediately realized that if you have a planet that's diving very close to the surface of its parent star, then its orbit will rapidly be circularized into a very, very tight orbit. And so <clears throat> both of these clues were sitting around for decades, but were ignored. And both of these clues are pointing to the existence of Jupiter-like planets in very, very short orbits around their parent stars. And so it turns out in 1995, these two guys discovered the first really bona fide extrasolar planet orbiting a solar-type star. There were some stars, there was a, a, some planets found orbiting a pulsar, which is a whole other interesting story. And then there was a sort of a large brown dwarf planet borderline or object that was found with radial velocity in 1989, but this, this planet, 51 Peg B, um, which was discovered by Michel Mayor and Didier Queloz in 1995, was the first you know, really exciting extrasolar planet, the first extrasolar planet that really got a lot of press. And um, 
this orbit right here takes four and a half days to go around. If you uh, go up to the planet, you'd see something like this. These are barbecue coals, um, just to show the, 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 the temperature. The temperature of the night side of this planet is similar to a hot barbecue. And so just like a hot barbecue glows with its own black body radiation, the night side of this planet, this is a hydrodynamic simulation, um, <coughs> should, should be glowing this sort of cherry red and orange. And it should be quite an, an amazing sight. And this, this sort of short period, Jupiter mass planet on a four and a half day orbit was a shock to everybody. But in retrospect, it shouldn't have been because the, the, the clues were there. So here's a, here's a the plot and sort of really gives a nice sort of history of the, of, of the field and shows the data at the same time. So time runs along this axis, 1990 up to um, a year or two ago. And this, this star, 55 Cancri, is a you know, similar star, similar to the sun. It's slightly less massive than the sun. It has a very, very distant binary companion. It's quite close to the sun. It's, it's relatively bright. And so right from the start, it was a, a star that was you know, seen as a possible host for extrasolar planets. And so starting in, in actually 1989, here at Lick Observatory, Jeff, Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler um, started observing this star using the radial velocity method, measuring its back and forth motion. And as you can see, for the first four years or so, first five years or so, their measurements are, are just a couple per year. And the, the, the error bars on their measurements are, 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 are quite large. So, they, they could tell that something was interesting, something was going on there, but they didn't have enough data and their data wasn't good enough to, to, to really know what was, what was happening. It was hard for them to get telescope time on the three meter telescope because planet searching at that time was somewhat disreputable. It had literally a 150 year history of not panning out, of generating articles which later had to be retracted, generating New York Times articles which were wrong. You know, uh, so so it, it just, it, for good reason, it was not a particularly, um, you know, sort of, sort of reputable field. <clears throat> in, in 1995, the first brown dwarf was discovered. <coughs> and then right after that, um, the first extrasolar planet around a sun-like star was discovered, 51 Peg. 51 Peg is obviously there. It was, it was a very, very strong detection. And so as soon as 51 Peg was discovered, you can see that the rate at which the purple points were accumulated spiked up. Um, Jeff and Paul started getting lots of telescope time. And then also by coincidence, just before the discovery of 51 Peg, you can see that the error bars on their, their, their points started to get much smaller. They made some improvements to their technique, which made the observations much more accurate starting in 1994. And so with increased data rate, with better observations, they started to see that there were planets in this system. Um, and so they, they announced the first planet, which has a 14-day orbit in 1997. They found two more planets in 2002, and I'll talk a little bit more in, 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 in coming slides about how they do this. Another planet was discovered in 2005, and then um, yet another one was discovered um, in 2010. This right here, so the, the, the so system contains a 14 day, plus a 44 day, plus a 260 day, plus a 5,200 day planet, four planets, um, fit two, two decades of, of, of radial velocity. And so when you take those four planets out, this is the, the, the power spectrum that, that, that remains. So for a number of years, it was thought that there was a planet with a period of 2.8 days. This was discovered in 2005. Um, it was thought that there was a planet with a period of 2.8 days in this system. And the reason why that was thought was because everybody Everybody who was in the planet business um, would start their periodograms at one day. They're just like, you know, it's just like, and, and the reason why people are like, ah, planets less than one day period, that's just nuts, right? So they, with, without even really thinking about it, they just start plotting at one day, and then on a logarithmic scale go out to 10,000 days. <clears throat> and it turns out that this peak right here 
is actually an alias, a, a sort of a shadow, if you will, of um, a 0.74 day planet that, 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 that's actually there. And so you might ask, well, how, how do you know whether this 0.74 day planet is, is real or not? You know, is this just another case of, of Barnard's star 40, 40 years later? Um, it turns out that that innermost planet actually goes in front of the, the, the parent star is seen from Earth. So this is the planet with the orbital period of 0.9 or 0.73 days. And what's cool about this diagram is it's completely to scale. Normally, when you see exoplanet stories, the scales are completely screwed up. And there's no reason for this, right? The, we, we don't know what these planets look like. We really have no idea at all what these planets look like. The one thing we do know is how large they are physically and the shapes and sizes of their orbits. So the one thing that we do know is we can compute, you know, what one planet would look like in the sky or the others, how, how large a star. We could make scale diagrams. It's normally never done. But this, this right here is a true to scale diagram. And because the orbital period of the planet is so short, it can be shown in an interesting way when you just have this crude resolution. You can see the individual pixels here on, on, on the screen. Here's the planet. Here's you know, Saturn to scale. Here's the star. And then this is the orbit. And um, this right here shows the dip in the light which occurs when the planet goes in front of the star. So we know that this planet, which was detected through radial velocity, is there because when it goes in front of the star, it occults some of the light. Now, where am I in, in, in terms of time? I have no idea. Okay, yeah, so, so that's the thing about, it used to be easy to get an extrasolar planet talking and kind of keep it, keep, it, keep it on time because there was like one planet to talk about. Um, now, there's, now there's literally thousands to talk about and I've, I've talked about like two or three of them at, at the most, right? So there's I have slides and slides and slides and slides that I could go through, but in the interest of time, I can't. Um, so, so this, this transit method has proven to be very, very um, um, influential and important. <clears throat> this was the first transiting extrasolar planet was found in <clears throat> 1999 um, orbiting a sun-like star. This is a planet that's somewhat larger than Jupiter going in front of a sun-like star. And so you can see the dramatic dip in light. <clears throat> this is the Hubble Space Telescope that made this, this, this data that, that occurs when the planet goes in front of the star. This picture was taken up in Lick Observatory. This is a transit of Venus that occurred just a couple of weeks ago. This is the 36-inch refractor. And they did a beautiful thing there. They, they took um, the, the focal plane, they stretched a, a, a white cloth across the focal plane. So this is an image of the sun this is sort of the eyepiece of this grand refractor. This is some of the supporting structure for the dome. And then you can see the <clears throat> Venus transiting in, in, in front of the sun right there. So you see what you're resolving here, what is seen only in the amount of light for extrasolar planets. I'm also starting to lose my voice for some reason. So <clears throat> um, this is sort of where we're at right now um, without plotting the huge number of planets that are coming from Kepler. And <clears throat> what you can see, what I'm plotting here is, is, is planetary period here, uh, logarithmic axis, and planet mass up here, also logarithmic. Can I have a glass of water? I'm just, is that, is that a? Yeah, I'll just take this. <clears throat> And for, for, for comparison, I plotted Earth and, and, and Jupiter. And then what I can do here is I just <clears throat> blurred it out. And so you can, you can see from looking at that that there's, there's three clumps of, of, of planets. <clears throat> this is a period <clears throat> in this axis and a mass in this, in this axis. There's this lump here, which are the uh, hot Jupiters. And there's this lump out here which are planets that are like Jupiter, but in general, they're somewhat more massive than Jupiter, and they have somewhat shorter orbital periods than Jupiter. If I go back to the real diagram, <clears throat> Jupiter is lying on the edge of that sort of distribution of planets. And for a long time, it seemed like <clears throat> Jupiter was, 
on the edge because we weren't yet able to detect planets that were further out. But we do have a good ability to detect planets that are in this region. Jupiter is really on the fringe of this, this, this distribution of planets here. Jupiter is an intrinsically somewhat rare object. The hot Jupiters, there's lots of them have been detected, but they're very, very easy to detect. And it turns out, and this is very, very recent um, sort of realization, that if you take the stars in the local solar neighborhood, over half of them have a planet with an orbital period that's less than 100 days and a mass that's sort of several times that of Earth, but less of Neptune. The vast majority of the planets in our galaxy are falling in this, this lump right here. So I can go very quickly through a whole bunch of slides. You can see it's just like totally um, just didn't, didn't, didn't work out in terms of, of how I thought the timing would go. Um, <clears throat> and this is, these purple, purple objects here are planets that are detected by, by Kepler. And what you can see is that the overwhelming number by number of planets are falling in this region of the diagram, right? There's a couple up here, a couple out here, but as far as planet formation goes, as far as the galactic planet census goes, this is what's going on. Now, what I've plotted here, period is in days, okay? And then what I've plotted here is not the mass, but the mass ratio with the parent star, okay? And um, if you're talking about all the stars being solar mass, then it, it will come out the same. But what I've also done is because I have the mass ratio, I've, I've taken the satellite systems of the giant planets in our own solar system, and I've plotted them as well. So these green dots are the regular satellites of the giant planets in our own solar system. So the, the you know, Ganymede and Io and Europa and Titan and Triton and Enceladus. They look remarkably like the extrasolar planet systems that are being discovered by Kepler. And the, the, there's a number of, of um, additional similarities, simul similarities that aren't expressed on this diagram. The, the Jovian satellites are very close to coplanar, and their orbits are very circular, much more circular and much more coplanar than the orbits of the planets in our own solar system. And it turns out that the systems that Kepler is discovering are the same way. They turn out to usually have several planets per star, and the planets are orbiting very much in the same orbital plane, and their orbits are quite close to circular. So it's this very interesting realization that if we had thought that extrasolar planets would look like the planetary systems that are orbiting our Jovian planets, we would not at all be surprised with what the galactic planetary census has turned up. But if we, having had gone in there, we, we thought that the planets would look like our own solar system, it's turned out to be much more surprising and, and much different than we had thought. So the Earth is, is, is this object right here. This is the Earth and that's Venus. And then this is Jupiter. They haven't been looking long enough. But what's interesting is, is that this, more than half of stars have a planet like this. In our own solar system, we have absolutely nothing like this. Mercury has an orbital period of 88 days and has no mass. It's, it's basically not there. Um, more than half of, sol of, of stars in the solar neighborhood have something that's larger than Earth, and roughly the mass of Neptune or slightly less than Neptune, with an orbital period that's less than that of Mercury. Our own solar system just didn't participate in that mode of planet formation. So it remains to be seen, are we rare at the 10% level? Are we rare at the run percent level? Are we rare at the part in 10,000 level? That, that's something that's completely, um, it, it's not clear yet. But planetary systems, on average, don't look like our own planetary system. Yeah. Oh, so, so, you know, so if Jupiter had formed close to the sun and then been pushed outward. Um, yeah, so, so, so normally, normally in planet migration theories, it works the other way. So normally you have Jupiter forming out there and then migrating inward to 
produce a hot Jupiter. That's how we believe these hot Jupiter planets here are formed. We believe they're probably not forming where they are seen now, but rather they form out here and then either through the COSI, mostly through the COSI mechanism, which we know works, and possibly through disk migration, which may work, they get deposited in here. But there's, there's no real viable known mechanism for producing them in here and then pushing them out there. That, that wouldn't, wouldn't be understood how to do that. Neptune moved out a little bit, and we know that because we see that, that small objects like Pluto and a number of other objects with similar orbits have been caught into resonance with Neptune as Neptune migrated outward. But my, Neptune didn't migrate through the whole solar system. It, it formed probably somewhere near where it is now and then pushed out a little bit. There may have been some swapping of orbits in our own solar system. There's a theory called the Nice model, which has uh, Uranus and Neptune trading places. Models like that, and this is another thing as a science journalist, if, if, if someone purports to explain something, then make very clear you find out how many assumptions they needed to make in order to explain something. So the Nice model is a good example. It explains something like five things. It explains why the Trojan satellites are there. It explains uh, the late heavy bombardment. It explains the low mass of Neptune and Uranus relative to Jupiter and Saturn. It explains the Plutinos and it explains one other thing. It seems like this is... What was that? Oh, well, yeah, that's the fifth thing. That's the fifth thing, right? Now, in order to explain five things, they have to assume at least six things, right? So it is actually a step backward. And I, you know, I'm not being facetious. The, the, Any time the model has more parameters than the number of things that it explains, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to write about it. And so, so find out. It's like, how many, how many things, how many free parameters did you have? How many, how many knobs are there in your computer program? Um, there are some kids that are Everybody assumes everything. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's right. There, but, but, but what we're talking about is, is any time that a supercomputer was involved. No, no, yeah. But if a supercomputer was involved, that, that would be my, that would be my if, if a supercomputer was not involved, then I would be more willing. Are there an F is equal to MA and you know, that sort of thing. But if the supercomputer was involved, find out how many parameters there were, find out how many things that the model is purporting to explain. So, so the COSI mechanism, the COSI mechanism is nice as, 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 as we were talking about F is equal to MA, it only involves F is equal to M and F is equal to M A. Um, with COSI, you have two objects, say two stars, on a binary orbit, and then you have a third body orbiting one of the members of the binary pair. Yeah, and that's this cycling that occurs where the orbit basically goes from a low eccentricity, low inclination state to a high ex. Sorry. <laughs> low eccentricity, high inclination state to a high eccentricity, low inclination state. It cycles back and forth, conserving angular momentum. So it's simply a, it's, it's a, it's a natural consequence of F is equal to MA applied to three bodies. And so it's very secure. And it made these strong predictions. It's just that people didn't realize that it was making those predictions. Um, so, so the more planets you have, the, 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 the sort of the, the more problematic the, the mechanism becomes. And so these hot Jupiters, interestingly enough, are invariably, or almost invariably, the only planet that can be found in the system. So it works when you have a single Jupiter mass planet and then a binary star. If there's other stuff, that just gets cleared out early on. It just gets ejected. Um, these Kepler systems don't suffer from the COSI at all. It's sort of the opposite. There's multiple planets, and they're in extremely circular orbits, and they tend not to be affected by distant binary companions, usually because the binary companion is in the plane of the system itself, and so this COSI mechanism is just shut off. It just doesn't operate. Transits. So Kepler stares at a spot of the summer Milky Way, 
Uh, it's about 110 degrees square. It monitors about 150,000 stars continuously. Um, and it's just had its mission extended, so it'll be basically a seven-year, eight-year stare at 150,000 stars. And they're watching for these periodic dimmings which occur. Earth going in front of the sun, as seen from another distant star, blocks about one ten thousandth of the sun's light for a period of about 13 hours. So they're watching for those events where the star dips by part in 10,000 that lasts for 13 hours, and then it occurs again at a regular interval. And it's that regularity that's key, because the stars are actually a lot more noisy than you would like. That Kepler can detect. So um, the, the, more, the, the shorter the orbital period, the smaller the planet can be detected. So if we take Earth, Earth is sort of comfortably above, but not, not that far above Kepler's detection limit. So Kepler was designed to comfortably detect Earth-like, Earth-sized planets in year-long orbits. So Kepler needs to see Earth go in front of the sun four times in order for the detection to be significant. It hasn't had four years. There's, I mean, you see those things, right? So there's Earth in there. And the data is public. So. I wanted to stick up for some. I'm not. I'm, I'm, it's fine. Your point is well taken, and you're absolutely right. Whether you're doing the calculation analytically or you're doing it with a supercomputer, if there are a lot of assumptions in there, that are questionable. The results should be questioned. But some, and often supercomputers are used in that sort of parameter model. study. Yeah, so, so, and, and, right, I mean, I, I, they, they are just yeah, so, so, so my, that, that, that's right, and there's only one, there's only one universe, and, and so, with, with planets, a, a good, a good, a good example is, is, is weather on extrasolar planets, All right, so there's a whole bunch of 3D global Boussinesque approximation, and even, you know, straight, straight, um, just solving solving momentum equation um, that purport to show what the weather patterns look like on extrasolar planets. Now, as you well know, as you go from 1,000 degrees to 2,000 degrees, you start to ionize the alkali metals, and the magnetic field starts to couple to the momentum equation, and so you have you know, the V cross B, and, the, and, 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 and th that isn't taken into account, right? So the weather there, they're assuming that it blows right through the magnetic field lines, and the magnetic field lines don't respond, but they have to, right? They absolutely have to. So all the... I agree with Yeah, so... so In extrasolar planets, every single supercomputer simulation that's ever been done in the context of extrasolar planets has assumptions and has free parameters. And my talk is about extrasolar planets. And I'm, I'm yeah, that's right. I'm not, I'm not saying you know, don't believe the cosmologists, don't believe Joel, those guys. I'm just talking about anybody's talking about extrasolar planets or anything in our own solar system's formation. Joel. Yep, yep. So, so. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so the, okay, okay. So, so the reason why they're so eccentric is, is, and th th this is sad and this is cynical, but it's true. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a circle. Okay, 
and I give you darts, right? And you throw them, and they land randomly in the circle. Do more of them land near the edge of the circle or near the center of the circle? They land near the edge, right? So, so all of those eccentricities are an artifact of the modeling, which is not taking that effect into account. Now, of course, there are planets, like my favorite planet. I'll just indulge you guys with, with um, my favorite planet. So anyway, here, here's, 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 some, here's, some, here's some eccentricities. So um, this is an, that's a circle, and that's an orbit with an eccentricity of 0.2. Looks like a circle has just been pulled off, off, off center. Mercury is the most eccentric orbit in our solar system of the eight planets in our solar system, and it has an eccentricity of 0.21. There's Mercury. Um, there's an eccentricity of 0.4. Here, you can still sort of mistake that for a circle. Um, what I'm plotting here is these are moments of equal time in the orbit. So it's moving quickly through periastron. It's going slowly through apoastron. Um, even at 0.4, you can still sort of believe that that's a circle, right? That has to do with this, this, this bias towards these eccentric orbits that you're referring to. Um, here's, uh, I, I was just harshing on supercomputer simulations. I did this on my Mac, but it's using your code, using your, your Zeus, Zeus, Zeus code. I mean, I wrote it, I wrote it, I coded it up myself, but it's, it's, it's your code, right? I, I copied it line by line from your paper. Um, and so anyway, so th that's like I was like I was purporting to report all of these violent storms on the surface of this planet. Now these, these simulations don't involve the magnetic fields, and the, the temperature here is cycling up to 2,107 degrees Kelvin, right? So this, this simulation is pretty much nonsense because it doesn't include the magnetic field coupling, as are all the other simulations out there in the literature. I, I didn't publish this, but I've been showing it in talks. Um, now here's. Here's a planet with a genuinely eccentric orbit. And this has been observed uh, again and again and again. And so this, this orbit is, is secure. This, this planet has a 114-day orbit and eccentricity of 0.932. So this guy spends most of his time out at an orbit similar to, or a distance similar to where Earth is from the sun. And then every 111 days, it comes screaming through to within six or so stellar radii of, of, the, um, of, of the star. This is a low-tech, high-tech. Uh, so th this, is, this is actually, it's not quite as eccentric. It's extra to 0.9. That's a, a kumquat and a, and a peppercorn. And I just took 100 pictures, one after another. And you can see one of them, you can see my, my finger with the, with the um, <laughs> tweezers. Come in, but this shows how you go whipping through periastron and then you kind of dawdle around near apoastron. So what this is, is um, what I did was, was I, I put a, a camera, if you will, in orbit around the planet and then sent the camera and the planet around periastron. So this sort of shows the, the trajectory. It's sort of like a, a mission to an extrasolar planet done inside a computer. And then this is an animation of, of what it looked like. So the, the, the planet uh, has strong alkali absorption and Rayleigh scattering in its atmosphere. So when the planet is illuminated, it appears blue. So the, the, the planet illuminated by the stars should be blue um, if, if the modeling is correct. And it may not be correct, but if it is correct, it would be blue. And then on the, the night side, after it's been heated, it's glowing with the heat that it absorbed from the star. And these are the hydrodynamic motions on its surface. Came out of Mike Norman's code, um, just, just to let you know. Um, and <laughs> might be wrong, um, but, but, but it, 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 um, this is sort of what you would see if you were orbiting this planet. And so at the end here, you can see, this is several days after the close, the close encounter. It's still glowing on the night side, and then it's illuminated on its day side. And the color should be similar to Neptune for the similar reasons, Raleigh scattering and absorption by methane. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know anything about how life forms. I mean, so, so, so that's the other thing. Why do we care about the different shapes of the Well, it's because, but well, for one, we, we can measure them, right? And they give us clues to the formation mechanisms, right? So, 
formation mechanisms that involve dissipation as part of the formation process lead to circular orbits. So Saturn's rings are incredibly, all those particles are incredibly circular orbits and they're all incredibly low in inclination relative to each other. They're just like kind of bouncing off each other at centimeters per second, right? There's no high eccentricity there. Formation processes that are violent, that involve planet-planet collisions and ejections and all that kind of stuff lead to survivors that are on inclined and eccentric orbits. So that's where this focus is coming from. All the talk about life, habitability, don't, don't believe any of that, right? A, an equally valid question is, is like, do you think, you know, on this planet, do you think their stock market is having a good year? Ask them that, right? I mean, it's, there's, it's just makes just as much sense as asking about life and how, I, we don't know what those plants are. We have no idea. We have no idea how life forms, whether life is common, and this stuff about extrasolar planets gives no insight into that, zero. Right, but even if we were finding, even if we, did, we, even if we, we have no idea, and also there's, you know, there's, there's, there's 100 billion stars in the galaxy, so if 10% you know, of them are like our solar system, or even if one ten thousand, they're still, right, it's just, we're not talking about life. This, this, this talk was not about life. You know, it was not about habitability. And to our editors, yeah, so, so it's just like, keep, keep that in mind and you know, ask them how, you know, what, kind of, what kind of year are they having on the stock market on that planet. Just, just ask them. Yeah. So, 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 so invariably, you, you'll never get anything from the press release, right? So you have to talk to the scientist. And then ask them, what are your free parameters? Ask them, what are you trying to explain in advance? And ask them, what are your predictions? Right, so, so Neptune, Neptune and Pluto is a great example, right? So if, if, if the Nice model had come out in 1930 or 1929, and had done all the stuff that it, that, it, that it purports to do, and in addition said, we expect to find objects caught in three to two orbital resonance, small icy objects caught in three to two orbital resonance with Neptune, and then Pluto had been found in the next year, I would have been excited about it, right? So try to figure out whether it's postdictions or predictions that are, that are involved with, and, and push, push, the, push the scientist, right? If there's a press release, there's usually an ulterior motive. Yeah, and, 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 and it's all about nuance, it's all about subtlety, and that's lost. That's lost, right? If, and I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing against people who write press releases, you have to do that, right? And you have to make it exciting, you have to make it interesting, right? So there's this tension, an unavoidable tension between the need to make things digestible, simple, interesting, exciting, and to be accurate and nuanced. And that is, it's, it's, there's no easy answer, no easy answer to that. Yeah. Can I just add, so I, I think that it's, there's, a, there's just a fundamental tension between trying to afford a result when the course was on after you have a result and a scientific method which takes yeah. half a decade, Absolutely. half a decade, Absolutely. And the fact that interesting results are always the two and a half to three sigma level, right? They're always going to be controversial. Yeah. 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 So, well, so, so my data set, so, so, so funding. I'm, I'm not one of these climate science deniers or anything like that, right? I, I'm just saying funding is getting tighter and tighter and tighter in astronomy all the time. 
right? You have far more astronomers than can you know, be supported by our society, and they are scrambling, scrambling, scrambling for jobs, for funding. What I'm saying is, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's disruptive. What I'm saying is that there is pressure, there is pressure to make your results sound more exciting than they are. Well, you, right, you, 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 you're, you're getting contacted by the, you know, you're, you're, you're calling your researchers, you're saying you have interesting stuff, or they're coming to you. But, but oftentimes, articles come out at the same time as the paper comes out, right? I mean, there's, it's not always you look at articles that have been published in the journal and then write the articles about, and that's not what always happens. Well, that's not, not that's the, the case of embargo stuff, but, but for the most part, you have a relationship with the journal. Yeah. No, no, I, I know. I, all, I, all I'm saying is, is that, that I think that in extrasolar planets, I think there's a lot of hype. Yeah. Well, I, just, I, I disagree with you. I don't know too much about how this, this goes in extrasolar planets, but I think a lot of different motivations. Oh, there are some. Absolutely. But there are. You know, for example, before every American Astronomical Society meeting, somebody reads through the abstracts and picks out a number just for what they think are miserable. And that's about as fair as you can get without regard for who's looking for a job or whatever. And I think, um, I don't know what the cut for was called, the planet detection is, but, but I, I, think it's also I think there's plenty of quite decent motives for yeah. good questions. It's not the least of which is we'd like to have a scientifically literate public. Yeah, but extra source planets give giving us more time a lot more of it. I've let this discussion go on because I thought it was important. And uh, so, I, you know, but yeah, it's just, thank you. Thank you so much.